Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this Mary Ellen van der Heiden reading from The Family Chow, a novel by Lan Samantha Chang. I'm today not the one who will be introducing Samantha, as you can all expect, because we are all crazy about introductions. Um, but um, I would like to say one thing about her. In a recent interview, Sam was asked to give a piece of writing advice. And uh, we got some, quite some writing advice uh, this week also from Suzanne McConnell, who spoke about her time with Kurt, uh, Kurt Vanagat at Iowa. And this is what Sam uh, said. My one piece of advice for writers is to follow your own heart. Don't try to figure out what is in fashion. Write what you want to read and write about what matters to you. Sam, there is nothing more to say. I think this summarizes what's inside you, your excellent commitment, and most of all, your authenticity. Thank you for sharing some of that with us tonight. Uh, we feel really honored. So now I'm going back to my script and what I was supposed to say. Um, first of all, um, I have to say something about the Mary Ellen von der Heiden Fellowship in Fiction, which was established in 2007. And it recognizes Mary Ann van der Heijn's lifelong passion for fiction. Her husband, Carl, is a native Berliner and a founding trustee of the American Academy in Berlin. He served as the institution's treasurer for more than a decade and is a co-chairman from 2009 to 2011. I take it that probably both uh, Mary Ann and Carl are watching tonight. So in this case, good evening and hello, Mary Ann and Carl. Um, Carl is uh, actually also a piece of uh, authenticity. I remember when I started working here at the Academy, which was uh, quite a long time ago, and I was about in my first year, and then uh, at some point someone said, Carl von Neiden is coming. And I thought, oh God. Um, and I was... Uh, close to death and then he he came into my office and uh, I was working in the development department. I was uh, preparing a donation receipt for me and my back then boss told me, no, no, you don't have to give it to me, give it directly to him. I'm like, okay. So I put the thing in an envelope and there came Carl and I was like, oh. Um, <laughs> and uh, I gave it to him and he takes the thing out of the envelope hands me the envelope back and tells me, you can reuse this. <laughs> so <laughs> this actually uh, shows that he was a very good treasurer uh, for the American Academy in Berlin. Um, so back uh, to this evening. And um, this evening is uh, and so far uh, also special because we're here in the midst of a pandemic. Um, and uh, But there is one good piece or one good takeaway from the uh, pandemic. And this is actually the fact that we can now so easily bridge distances with simple and familiar means. In this sense, we're especially delighted to have not only one von der, uh, von der Heiden Fellow here with us this evening, Lan Samantha Chung, but also a second. Tom Drury, who has graciously agreed to introduce Sam this evening and is joining us live from Iowa. Um, as a former fellow and current, current visiting professor of fiction at the Iowa Writers Workshop, there is nobody who would be better or more dangerous to introduce Sam. Um, Tom is the author of Pacific, The End of Vandalism, Hunts and Dreams, The Driftless Area, and The Black Brook. He was named one of Granta's best young American novelists in 1996 and received a, received a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2000 to 2001. The End of Vandalism was cited as one of the best novels of the past 45 years by GQ magazine in 2002. And Pacific was long listed for the National Book Award in 2013. His essays and short fiction have appeared in The New Yorker, Pluff Sharers, Hoppers, Granta, The New York Times Magazine, The Mississippi Review, and Tricycle, The Buddhist Review. We're lucky uh, to have Tom with us uh, in Berlin, <laughs> not only uh, for his fellowship in 2015, but also um, when he was here in Berlin for subsequent years. And we hope um, that you will 
find us find your way back before long. Before I give the floor, the virtual floor, over to Tom, allow me just to say a few words uh, about the procedure for this evening. Um, for those of you who are joining us via Zoom, um, there will be a QA and a um, after Sam's reading. Um, you are uh, free to type in the questions anytime. Um, also, during the talk, um, after the talk, we will then uh, be in conversation with uh, Sam and I will read the question. If you're uh, here with us tonight, it's uh, pretty simple. You um, raise your hand. And um, if you are in Zoom, please do not raise your hand, the, hand, uh, the raise your hand function. Um, please use the Q&A icon. Um, so I think uh, that was uh, it for the introduction. Thank you so much, Sam. And thank you so much, Tom. It's an honor. First, I want to do a shout out to the uh, Iowa Writers Workshop. A number of um, workshoppers are, I believe, maybe gathered in the Frank Conroy room um, at Die House in Iowa City. And uh, I want to say, good evening, American Academy. Thank you for having me. I miss you. And I miss poker nights in the library with John and Gail in the class of spring in 2015. Should the current class be interested uh, in continuing this tradition, John says he still has the poker chips. <laughs> it is my total honor tonight to introduce Lan Samantha Chang, whose own writing and directorship of the Iowa Writers Workshop have profoundly influenced contemporary literature, making it more open, more innovative, and more original. Every year, she brings together incredibly talented poets and fiction writers from all over the world and she tells them something along the lines of, follow your heart, oh wait, that's already been said. <laughs> but anyway, it's great advice. That's how we know it's a good quote. Um, don't worry about what's in fashion, right, but what matters to you. I actually met Sam thanks to the American Academy. As some of you may recall, Amy and I stayed on in Berlin after the fellowship. And in 2018, Sam came to Berlin and gave a reading from a novel in progress that would turn out to be The Family Chow, the magnificent work that Sam will be discussing tonight. In a beer garden gathering after that reading, Sam asked if I would be interested in coming back to the States to be a visiting professor at the workshop. Well, this is not the kind of thing that you turn down. So I said, yes, I'd be very interested. And that's why I'm Zooming from Iowa City, where I'm still visiting. Those who know Sam will not be surprised by this act of spontaneous generosity. The stories are many. If students are going on a winter road trip, Sam stays up late or gets up early, I'm not sure, to email them about icy driving conditions. If a member of the workshop community is recovering from surgery, Sam tracks down a French novel she'd want to read and brings it to her doorstep. If workshoppers need something to give away at a reading, she knits them a pair of mittens, which is another thing to know about Sam. She really likes knitting. Knits during readings. Knits while playing a deceptively casual game of werewolf. <laughs> this is all a way to say, from those of us in Iowa City and from me, Sam, we're happy and proud that you're getting this time at the American Academy, and we're confident you're doing wonderful work on your new project, and you are missed. Some facts about Sam. Born in Appleton, Wisconsin, one of four daughters of parents who'd emigrated from China in the mid-century. Attended Appleton West High School, Yale, the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, and in the early 1990s, the Iowa Writers Workshop, where she studied with Marilyn Robinson, James Allen McPherson, and Frank Conroy whom she would succeed as workshop director in 2006. And here she broke two barriers, becoming the first woman and the first Asian American to hold this vital post in the world of literature. Sam has written a collection of exquisite short fiction called Hunger and three extraordinary and acclaimed novels, Inheritance, All is Forgotten, Nothing is Lost, and now The Family Chow, about a Chinese American family their restaurant in small town Wisconsin, their passions and disappointments, and the scandal that will envelop their lives. I was lucky enough to read The Family Chow in manuscript form in August of last year. 
And I was truly enthralled, there's no other word for it, by Sam's visionary insight into what it means to be alive and what it means to be an immigrant or a child of immigrants in the Midwest, by the characters who seem to rise off the page, sometimes cruel, sometimes kind, often hilarious, often hungry, by the grace and narrative power of the language, by the sheer genius Sam brings to giving new and original life to the form of the brothers Karamazov, and not least by the food in the novel, the shared preparation and eating of which, so beautifully described, provides a true line of comfort where comfort is much needed. One of my notes was, novel makes me hungry. And I had some others. I'm very much looking forward to hearing, hearing Sam talk about, and I hope read from the family Chow, which Ian Lee has called one of the finest and most ambitious novels about America I've read in recent years. Ladies and gentlemen, Academy Fellows and Friends, Iowa Writers Workshop, please join, join me in welcoming Lam Samantha Chang. Thanks so much, Tom. I'm going to wave in what I think is your direction. And hello, everybody, tonight, and hello to the students who are at the Die House. I miss you guys, too. Thanks so much, Tom. Thanks, Barrett, for your sort of generous introduction and introduction of Tom. And thanks so much, Tom, for your generous introduction. And if it weren't for Tom, I wouldn't be here because Tom is the writer. Tom Drury is the writer who told me all about the American Academy in Berlin. Um, he told me about the wonderful people who work here to make it possible for us to think about our work and about the great community of fellows, as well as the wider community of people here in Berlin. And now that I've been at the Academy for a few months, I can see why Tom was so enthusiastic about his time here. Thank you, American Academy, and thanks to the Mary Ellen von der Heiden Fellowship and to everyone here who's making this semester so productive for me and my family. So. When I applied to the Academy, this novel, The Family Chow, was significantly unfinished. But the global pandemic, which shut us into our homes, functioned as an opportunity for many writers to complete long-term projects. And I was able to finish mine a couple months before I got here. So tonight I'm going to read from that novel, which is forthcoming from W.W. W. Norton in 2022. Um, first, a few words about the novel. Uh, the family chow meant many things to me as I was writing it. It is perhaps first and foremost an homage to Fyodor Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov. It is also a portrait of a Chinese American family as it explores questions of long-term cultural assimilation. And it's a portrait of a Chinese American community in a small Midwestern city. As that it's a plotted novel about the mysterious death of a patriarch and the question of what could have caused that death. I thought tonight I would read from the middle of the novel because these chapters explore some of the effects of long-term cultural assimilation, as I talked about in my application to the Academy. So I need to catch you up a bit since I'm starting in the middle. These chapters are set in Haven, which is a small Wisconsin city they're set a few days before Christmas. Their three brothers, Dago, Ming, and James Chow, and their father, Leo Chow, a larger-than-life restaurateur, the patriarch and tyrant. Leo and Dago, the oldest son, are embroiled in a conflict because Dago wants to become a partner in the restaurant. Ming, the middle brother, is a banker in Manhattan, and James is a pre-med student. In the chapters I'm reading, Ming calls a meeting with his younger brother, James, at the town's rival restaurant, which is sort of a failing diner owned by the rival restaurant family, um, which is sort of a European-descended family, white, white family. Um, and the reason he calls the meeting at the other restaurant is that no one knows where they are. Um, that he wants to discuss some troubling developments. 
Um, the only other thing you need to know is that in the first chapters of this book, James is coming home for Christmas when in the bowels of the Chicago train station, he administers CPR to an old Chinese man who is taken to the hospital he, and dies. Um, but the, the, the EMTs leave his luggage behind. It's just left behind in the, in the rush of the whole thing. And so James picks up the bag somewhat absentmindedly and brings it along home with him. He's sort of affected by his experience um, with the CPR. So he leaves it somewhere, either in his, dad's ha in his dad's car or in the house. And at the moment, he's not sure because the minute he gets home, all this stuff happens. And he never looked to see what was inside of it. So you need that in order to understand this chapter, which is called, I'm going to read two chapters. The first is called The Other Restaurant. 20 minutes later, when James arrives at Scares, the diner is almost empty. With its plate glass windows, fluorescent glow, stark counters, the place seems deliberately reminiscent of the Hopper painting, but James is fairly sure the Scares haven't striven for the effect. He peers through the window under bright light. A few lonely afternoon owls of Haven who don't eat Chinese food hunch over the counter as if posing for the artist. Inside, the restaurant is pleasantly warm. From a booth on the far side, someone waves at him. It's Ming. Ming has hung his overcoat on a rack near the booth. He's combed his hair. A small, expensive-looking suitcase defends his side of the booth, and James remembers again that Ming has a flight this evening. No one reproves him about this or insists that he spend Christmas at home. He became independent long ago. This is like that riddle about the town with the two barbers, Ming says, as James approaches. You go to a small town with only two barbers. One of the barbers has a bad haircut. If you and I want privacy, we're doomed to a shitty meal. The food can't be that bad. Ming shrugs and checks his phone. There's one good thing on the menu, and it's the fish sandwich. He waves his hand at the other side of the booth. Sit down and order. Go crazy. Supper's on me. James sits. A young woman brings him a menu, laminated in plastic, illustrated with colorful photographs, open-faced, sliced turkey sandwich with gravy and mashed potatoes, a jaunty cheeseburger and fries. James's mouth waters. He loves American food. Although he's been eating at the dining hall for a semester, it's still exotic. Ming says, I have to eat anyway before I got on the plane, last flight to Chicago. How's this going, little brother? The server reappears with Ming's plate. She's about 24 with a messy bun of wavy orange hair so flame bright the filaments seem transparent. Here it is, Ming says. On the plate is a fried cod filet sandwich, a lettuce leaf, and a slice of pickle. Have you decided, she asks James, or would you like more time? I'll have the breakfast special with scrambled eggs and bacon, please, and hash browns. Look at that, Ming remarks when the server is gone. Real red hair. It's hard to find a genuine redhead now. Too much interracial breeding. He lifts the top bun and peers underneath, then replaces the bun and takes the bite. Crisp and light on the tartar. Perfect. Ming, says James, why were you so mean to Catherine? What's she ever done to you? Catherine? Ming clears his throat. Nothing. Not nothing. No, it's just she enrages me. She should get away from us for her own good. But she won't leave. Because she was adopted by well-meaning white people and raised apart from her kind, she is stuck on us. She's fetishized us. She wants to be us, for God's sake. And what she should really do is accept who she is, a highly intelligent, beautiful, very lucky, well-brought-up young woman who just happens to look like us. You're insulting her and us. Catherine and I are strictly business, Ming continues. James can tell the statement for Ming is both true and not true. She and I talk. We even have a coffee now and then when she's in New York, although she has to order tea because it's more authentic. He frowns at James. Why, you got something to tell me? Has Ming forgotten that he's the one who called this meeting? Has he forgotten the phone call at the restaurant? But since Ming is older, James obeys. He leans forward, ready to speak, prepared to pour out all the events of the day before. Doggo at his laptop, adding names and addresses to his list of invitations to the Christmas party. The confrontation between Catherine and Brenda Wozniak. Elf, that's their dog's second disappearance. 
Dago's broadcast, but he finds himself unable to speak to Ming about Catherine or Brenda or Alf or, for that matter, the phone call. Ba seems upset with Dago, he says instead. That's because Dago was his favorite. Their favorite still is. It seems perverse, given how different his parents are, to imagine that any of their sons could be the favorite of them both. Yet, as usual, Ming speaks with authority, as if relating an established piece of family history. Ming can remember. Six years older than James, he's had first-hand experience of things James will only hear about. James has the crushing sense that he was born too late to understand the real story of the Chows, that great pas- the great passions, the bedrock promises and betrayals that form the basis of whatever lies among the members of his family have long since taken place. Does their father disdain Dago because he once had such high hopes for him? Surely their mother doesn't feel that way. Ming says, whatever else you can say about her, Ma is just as traditional as Dad. Dago's their oldest son. He was supposed to be the crowning achievement of their lives in the U.S. He takes a bite and chews calmly, observing James, assessing his reaction. James stares at the table. Think back 35 years, Ming says. They've moved to this lousy town. They hate their lives. They hate the villagers. They hate the weather. They hate each other. But their eldest son... He's going to be a winner. You can tell by the way Ma talks about how Dago was as a baby, the way her voice will sweeten, the way she says he was such a precious baby, her bao bei, so bright, so large, so talented. Of course he would grow up and prove their lives were worth something. And Dago is large and smart, but he's turned out to be a disappointment. As usual, James cannot read Ming's eyes, flinty, fathomless, deliberately still. Ming seems even more detached than usual. Or has the scene with Catherine made James forget the exceptional nature of his middle brother's superpower, his impenetrability? James picks up his fork, testing its weight. He spreads the dark green napkin on his lap. He slides his hand hand into the pouch of his hoodie, touches the piece of candy from the temple, and a tiny slip of paper he's certain is an old fortune cookie fortune. Lamely, he says, he's really excited about the Christmas party. Maybe he's satisfied with how things are now. Who says he has to... Is he satisfied with the way he is now? The server arrives carrying James's plate of eggs. Can you get you and can I get you anything else? She asks perfunctorily. <laughs> Ming asks for another cup of coffee. When the server leaves, he murmurs, I don't know. Can you? James forks a bite of egg and crisp potatoes. It's delicious. He tries again. Maybe he's working on something, not the party, but another bigger project, and he'll show us someday. He'll surprise us. Or he could be thinking of applying to culinary school. Don't you understand, James? He's never going to change. It's too late for him. Too late. Dago's words come back to James. It's as if none of us can bear to be in our present lives. And James feels a sudden constriction in the area of his heart and lungs. Is it really true, he wonders, that there might be in any human life a certain window of time that matters more than any other? That he could be passing through it now as he sits holding a fork full of eggs, glimpsing it around him as through the window of a train and then leaving it behind, irretrievable, disappeared. I don't believe it, he says aloud. It's impossible that a person could get to be 33 and still have already lost his hope for the future. 34, Ming says. Youth is over at 34. By then, you've lost the gleam and possibility of youth, and most Americans couldn't give a shit about you. There are only certain times in life when emergence is possible. The life strategy for children of immigrants, starting with nothing, is to use that time to build social, educational, and financial capital on which to ride out the rest of their lives. Dago has blown it. He's now interested in salvaging his middle age by becoming a member of the petite bourgeoisie, but he doesn't have the capital to be a member of the petite bourgeoisie. James sets down his fork. He feels, to his confusion, the pressure of tears against his lids, but Ming is checking his phone and doesn't notice. It's no surprise, Ming says, putting down the phone. Of course, he would have to decide to settle down, to make a commitment to Haven. He has most of what he needs here, a place to live, a job people to love and hate? A job? 
But the restaurant isn't really his career. It's just where he's working now until James's voice catches in his throat. Don't be a snob, James, Ming says mildly. Of course it's his career. What I mean, James casts about, is that Doggo still must have other plans. If you're as close to him as you think you are, says Ming, you'd have noticed a while ago that he really doesn't have any plans. Oh, at first he used to say he was practicing to audition for the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra or whatever. And then for a while he was talking about moving back to New York or somewhere warmer, like Austin, and opening a record store. But now, after six years, I think he's gotten used to the idea of being a villager, working at the restaurant. Dago's given up. He's even found some kind of pride and honor, some dignity in giving up. He's telling himself he's helping mom and dad. He's their only truly filial son. He thinks the time he's putting into the restaurant is a kind of payment for the sacrifice dad thinks dad's made, something dad thinks dad deserves. But of course, he can't settle for having the most filial piety. He wants dad to recognize him as a partner in the business. What Doggo doesn't understand is that even if he settles here, dad is never going to let him get his hands on the restaurant or on the pile of cash he's no doubt hoarding, at least not while he's alive. James asks a question he has never thought about before. Does Ba have a will? He's too confident to make a will, Ming grins. (laughs) According to state law, everything will go to Ma when he's dead. But anyway, Ba would never give anything to Dago. But Ba needs Dago. As he speaks, James knows this is true, and Doggo's been putting everything into the restaurant for six years. That was a self-destructive decision on his part, and he's nuts if he thought Howling Nushu was ever going to side with him. I told you these spiritual types side with the cash. I get a New Year's card from the Nushu every year since I started working in New York. How's everything tasting? At the sound of the server's voice, they both start. I asked for a cup of coffee, Ming says. When she's gone, they put their heads together again. He should have negotiated a deal with Dad in writing, Ming says. It's his fault if he didn't. But it's in Ba's interest to keep Doggo in the, in the business, James says. How can Ba keep up his share of the cooking when he gets old? It'll have to be Doggo. He's not old yet. Just 70. Says he's in his prime. No major health problems and still full of beans. James struggles against his brother's relentlessness. Then Doggo should get out of town. Doggo must escape. If you haven't noticed, Ming says, Doggo's not going anywhere. For several long minutes, James works on his breakfast. Ming isn't eating. The next chapter is called $50 million. Three brothers, Ming says, all three intelligent Promising, strong, but born into unspoken disadvantages. One, born to immigrant parents newly arrived in a new country with nothing but their foreign names. Two, born Asians in a community of white Americans. Three, born with strong Asian features, genetic markers of their nothingness, slant-eyed, yellow-skinned, gook-faced, Ming, James says he speaks as gently as possible because of the bitterness in his brother's voice and below the bitterness, the self-hatred and torment. Let me finish. Born, moreover, to a singular man who is despised by the community. The other Chinese immigrants hate him because he's depraved, unstable, and a crook. The other business owners, mostly whites, hate him because they see him as a squalid laborer, an illiterate, and a chink. And his white neighbors hate him because they think he's a usurper, greedy, and a chink. They would consider him a criminal, too, if they paid him the slightest bit of attention, but they've already dismissed him as a buffoon. And yet, despite being born to this man, the three sons grow up with looks, intelligence, and charisma. All this because their father, despite being a bullying and unscrupulous man, possesses a mysterious and undeniable force of character. He's a heathen. His long-suffering wife is a churchgoer. For years, she's been desperately faithful, a believer in miracles of the Gospels. But he believes in nothing but the urgency of his will, the superiority of his seed. Why be concerned about the afterlife when you have three sons, all physically intact, intelligent, ready to carry on your legacy, your blood, your name? Why believe in eternal life if you're never going to die? Because he does not believe in death. Death for others, yes, but for himself, it's not happening to him. 
Ming glances up at James. What? Yes, James exclaims, unable to take his eyes away from his brother. He envisions Ming, presenting in a corporate boardroom, emanating all the strength, the gleam of their father. He recalls Leo's reassuring voice. I'm not going to die. Ming goes on. The first son is raised to be a savior of the family, the bringer of justice, the righteous achiever who will justify each year of labor and sacrifice, the primary motive for their living in this isolated town, the sanctifier of their miserable marriage, the human answer to the questions waking them up in the night, why am I here? Why am I required to speak a language that can only express a shadow of my native intelligence? Why, asks the father, do I squander my natural gifts by feeding people who don't appreciate the food? Or, in the case of the mother, why do I stay with this bully? Why do I continue to have sex with this abominable man? And yet, despite this favoritism, perhaps because of it, the first son fails to thrive. He is a failure. In American terms, he has character flaws. He lacks initiative. He can't pull himself up by his own bootstraps. In truth, it's his parents who ruined him. He's spoiled. He's raised by them as an emperor in a society by, to which he's invisible. He hasn't been brought up to know how to, be how to be visible. He expects everyone to see him and adore him. And so when he comes of age and is cap catapulted, sorry, catapulted into American society, he falls back to earth, crawls home to live, not a king now that his inadequacies have been exposed, but a servant. Instead of a savior, he becomes nothing more than a dog to kick around. Ming takes a deep breath. But this isn't the story of the father, or even of the first son, that dissolute failure, but of the second son. Perhaps because they're already disappointed, the parents overlook the qualities of the second son, who was born possessing intelligence and, above all, reason. This advantage, a brain, has been given to no one else in his family. The rest of the family is all spleen and heart and guts, but no brain. This second son has never been the favorite. He doesn't own a single article of clothing that wasn't once worn by his older brother. He isn't given a single new toy. He's left alone. He has a rich fantasy life, this second son. Having no advantages at school or at home, he develops his ability to dream in classes where he excels, between classes when he's bullied in the halls, and after classes on the bus, especially on the bus, where no one will sit next to him, where he's called names, and boys throw spitballs and worse at him, and girls giggle and hold their noses. Ming mimics the gesture and enjoy watching this happen. On the bus, the second son envisions another self, impervious to all of this. Oh, he knows he's alone and surrounded by jeering children, but in his imagination, he's not being bullied. He's also watching. He can't feel strangers' fingers twist the corners of his eyes. He's invulnerable. In his mind, he stays on the bus as it goes past his house, past his neighborhood. The bus continues toward the edge of town where the houses are larger and the cars sleeker. The second son imagines that the people he calls Ma and Ba are not his real parents. How could they be? Because in his heart of hearts, he believes his real parents are white. They could be teachers, dentists, even mill workers. But they have craggy features, pink skin, and light eyes. They eat food as bland as their hair and skin color, and they gave birth to him, making him generic. This alone he desires, and wishes so much he believes it, possessing true potential, possessing, possessing the ability to truly become anyone and anything. Because America is not a democracy, it's not a place of opportunity, he knows, if you can't choose to be white. And because the second son despises these people he calls Ma and Ba, he doesn't honor or obey them. He breaks a fundamental tenet of Confucianism and one of the commandments as well. And oh, he's not so dumb, James. He knows this means he despises himself. Self-hatred is his meat and drink. Self-hatred is the fuel of his emotional life, his life in the world, his soon-to-be adult life. And yet he thrives, James. He becomes an achiever. You may be wondering how he manages to thrive while burdened by so much self-hatred. How can he succeed? How can he make it if he fundamentally doesn't think he should exist? 
It's because he manages to see above the wall of this disadvantage, because self-hatred is as galvanizing as ambition. He develops the ability to see above his deprivation and to realize that, in reality, he's lucky. Because he isn't cherished, he's allowed to aim beyond his parents' petty goals. He can leave them all behind. He earns a scholarship to an elite university on the East Coast where because of the assumptions about his name, some believe he's the descendant many times removed of a foundational historical figure in his father's native country. Because of this misunderstanding, a lie of omission, for it can't be for any other reason, although they say it's for his wit, etc., he gets chosen to be a member of a finals club in his senior year. There, he plays squash in their secret squash court and wears their not-so-secret tie. He eats the food cooked by their chef, a Chinese chef. Mr. Louis, a man actually from Vietnam who is trained as a pastry chef in France, and he adopts his clubmate's condescending gratitude for Mr. Louis's labor. While eating the meals of Mr. Louis, he makes a number of friends whose connections enable to him to find a job in the city, where he goes with no illusions about owning it or being it. He knows the city seduces people, dazzles them, and burns them up, but he knows not to believe and not to be betrayed. Every week, he puts a sum of money away where nothing can touch it. The second son pays very careful attention to appearances because he knows that in our outer lives lies success, because the balance sheet is a fingerprint of fortune's favor, because only in the numerable, the countable, can you find certainty, and only in certainty can you find truth. That's not true at all. James hears his own voice butt in stubbornly. Our inner selves exist. They're unique. They're meaningful and mysterious, even if they are secret, sometimes even from ourselves. Ming nods. You're thinking the second son is mistaken, he says. You may believe he has a special malady, a peculiar and uniquely individual malady of the soul. Certainly he thinks it's possible he doesn't have a soul. Although he doesn't think it makes sense to believe in such a thing, he's living in the 21st century. He has a soul, James says firmly. It's possible... Ming frowns. And yet, who can be sure? He suspects, not believing, only suspecting that that which feeds something like the soul, the vestigial soul, is missing. And perhaps as a result of this, he is inconsolable. Life, any kind of life, any small portion of any day in life is unbearable for him. The little things of life others enjoy, choosing a new pair of sneakers, eating fancy donuts, going to see the opening of a superhero movie, are so baldly insignificant he can't find pleasure in them. The more annoying details of living, getting stuck in traffic, making conversations with some stranger on the plane, are intolerable. Ordinary life or extraordinary life neither holds meaning. He's tried them both. Yes, there's still something missing. He isn't certain of this because he knows that he's dealing with the invisible realm. But he believes something is missing, and it can't be found through ordinary means. He's tried sex. He's tried relationships. He steals himself against the rejection of his Asian features, makes repeated efforts until he finds white women open to dating him. And he comes to dread the moment when a woman says to him, We have so much in common. Are her parents laborers? Do they spend their days working with their hands, physically caring and slicing and arranging and transforming food, no less, at the order of others? Do her parents make a hundred meals a day for people who think of them as semi-human, a smiling Asian couple like a pair of garden gnomes? Have her parents ever, for as little as a year, a month, ten days, five minutes, been in such straits, such financial and situational and familial arrears, that they decide to throw it all in, trade in what assets they have and, and their identities as citizens in another world to become aliens in this one? Has she grown up keenly observing, scrutinizing the children around her as if she were researching the most intricate sociology report? Their clothes, their games, their television shows, their preferred methods of cruelty, their figures of speech. Has she thought, sought invisible among, invisibility among them, hoped they would not notice her because the least bit of attention could transform into physical cruelty? He has had these parents. He has done these things. How else could he become such a success at finding cover, speaking in code? The fact is, she's nothing like him. And if she thinks she is like him, then she doesn't know him at all. And if she doesn't know him, it follows that her proclamations of love are as meaningless. 
It's almost with relief that he understands he can be alone again, can be desolate again. He breaks up with her, remembering that for him, none of this has ever been feasible because his heart, such as it is, is inconsolable. Ming raises his hand, signaling the server. Ming, James says again. He has never known what his brother's relationships were like, and now that Ming is telling him, he can hardly bear to listen. I want a cup of coffee. Did you hear me? Ming shouts, a cup of coffee. When he turns to James, he is wearing their father's furious, starving stare. James winces at his brother's expression, and yet, hasn't he always known this about Ming? That beneath his superiority and charisma, his hyper-competence, his high achievements, there existed this inconsolable self-hatred. He understands, says Ming, that through all of this he's been seeking solace from a source where it can't be found. He searches for a new answer to his questions, and he discovers it. It's hiding in plain sight. It's something he has known since childhood. That all of the stress and discomfort, the dullness and insignificant of his daily life, the only life he has, can be undone by money. The more money he has, the more his troubles can be undone. Why has it never occurred to him before, despite his immersion in spreadsheets and other people's monetary deals? Why has it not occurred to him that with a large sum of money, all the problems in his life can be transformed into tiny, insignificant data points, and he can be forever free of them? Really? said James. Is it possible? How much money? Fifty million dollars. <laughs> Ming peers sharply at James. Hear me out. Invested at only 5%, that equals an annual income of $2.5 million. $50 million would mean complete freedom, and I wouldn't be the only Chinese man who's put my hopes into my life savings. Ming signals to a server. We should order dessert just so they know we're still paying customers. But James, little brother, if you can find or earn enough money, you never need to squeeze onto a crowded subway car, never eat at a bad restaurant, never worry about anything that can be solved by purchase or payment. I'm working on a deal in Phoenix that'll make my career. I'm aiming for managing director. James asks cautiously, what about dating an Asian woman? <laughs> you know I never date Asian women. Ming raises his hand high above his head. Pie, that's what we need right now. The server approaches the table and he wraps out two slices of pie. What do you have, apple, German apple? All right, listen James, he says when the server is gone. It's Wisconsin, so they have German apple pie. Here's why I invited you here to talk. Your good deed has not gone unpunished. The dying man you gave CPR to, he was carrying his life savings in his luggage. His relatives somehow know that the money has disappeared. Instead, they were given a gift of Jolly Jow. This is this food that James handed to the EMT, but that's the other chapter. There are two pieces of pie arrive. Warm, each with ice cream. Ming scrapes the ice cream off of his pie and sets it to the side. He fixes his heavy-browed gaze again on James. The man in Union Station was apparently carrying some money. Not a huge sum of money, but quite a great deal for him. An EMT told his family about the nice boy who tried to help him. She remembers the boy's name, Chow. What on earth made you tell her your name? I picked up his bag, James says. I was going to check inside for his contact information, but forgot about it. I'm almost positive I switched it from your rental into the Ford when you dropped me at the restaurant. Do you remember me putting it in the trunk? It was dark, Ming says. I was on the phone. Where is it? What do I do now? Finders keepers. I have to give the money back to the family. Then whatever you do, don't tell Dad. You need to find the bag before he does. Check at home. Check inside the Ford. He took the other car to work today. James stares at his plate. Ming, I'm scared. What's to be scared of? What if it turns out entirely by accident? I sold someone's life savings. Fair exchange for trying to save his life. What if Ba finds it first and won't, won't let it give me back? Won't let me give it back? Well, then make sure you make Dad give you half. Ming shrugs. Don't look at me. I'm getting out of here. I have a flight tonight. I hope I beat the snow. James remembers the snatches of Ming's conversation with Olan. Is that what you and Olan were talking about? Ming appears startled, then impressed, as if he's surprised that James can eavesdrop. She warned me a storm was coming, he said. She said if I left tonight, I might get stuck in the snow. I told her it was fine. I'd rent a car and drive back to New York if I have to. I don't want to be stuck here for Christmas. 
What are you doing for Christmas? I'm going to take the day off. I just don't want to do it here. Do you hate it here that much? Ming looks directly into James with his implacable black eyes. James averts his gaze, and Ming says lightly, I've gotten over it. Mom, Dad, the house. The restaurant? especially the restaurant. I've gotten over the fact that we, you, me, and Dago, were raised to work at a restaurant in a hell hole in the middle of nowhere, that as children we had less than we deserved. I've gotten over that we were given no resources and no head start in the world, that we were, in fact, starting with a serious disadvantage, that we were bullied. Look, I pay the bullies here to make dinner for me now. We have our intelligence, our talents, and our ambitions. We work hard. And if we come from a place to be ashamed of, I got over it. He pokes at the back of his pie, breaking the crust with his fork. He takes a small bite. And if I were you, I'd get over it too, he says. There's hope for you if you give up on Dago. He shakes his fork slightly at James. Your ice cream is melting all over the place. True enough, the ice cream has slid off the pie. He spoons up a bit, but he's lost his appetite. They've made their choices. You're not responsible. You must live your life. Ming signals to the server. Our meeting here is done, he says, pointing at the clock. I've got the check. I've got to catch my plane, so you get going, kid. James looks at the clock. His heart skips. It's after four. He's supposed to meet Alice in less than, half, less than an hour. He has to take a shower. He has to change. Thanks for dinner, Ming. Safe travels. Merry Christmas. Sure. James leaves the diner and walks away down the snowy street. During his time at college, he's forgotten he never had to pay for a meal when one of his brothers was around. The habit is ingrained in them, the older family member taking care of the younger. It goes all the way up to Leo and his restaurant. James has never thought to break free of it. Walking wearily toward his father's house, he wonders how this idea of family love, this hierarchy of responsibility and obedience, has ha helped shape Big Leo's kingdom. The elder takes care of the younger, and in turn he is obeyed. His father, above all, obeyed. In one of James's earliest memories, he is standing outside in the backyard, close to this very street, with his mother. The backyard is surrounded by a fence. They have no dog at that time, but they bought the house and put up this fence with the understanding that someday they would have one. He and his mother stand at the clothesline under the afternoon sun next to a basket of soap-smelling, cool, wet laundry. James? Please count for me three clothespins, she says, bending to the bucket of clothespins and counting one, two, four. Winnie, smiling down at him, taking the wooden clothespins from his hand. One, two, three. Ming can say anything he wants, but James knows that he himself was once, and is, specifically, very much loved. Leo's Ford waits in the snow-covered driveway. James stops for a moment by the car, distracted. There's something Ming told him to do. He can't remember it. It'll come to him later. He lets himself into the house. Upstairs, he showers, puts on a clean shirt, and goes back down to wait for Alice. Thanks. Thank you so much. That was fascinating, and I, <laughs> I don't really know where to start. Um, I guess perhaps I start in the beginning. Okay. In the beginning uh, of you, with you. Um, what, uh, knowing when you, um, you know, or I would like to know a little bit more what actually drew you into writing. When did you, when did you oh. make up your mind? How did you, how did you come to it? Okay, so, oh, can everyone hear me? Sorry. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I grew up in Appleton, Wisconsin. Um, I have three sisters. There's four of us. Uh, our parents came from China. Um, they really wanted us to become uh, doctors. They wanted all of us to be doctors. It was some, you know, I, one of my sisters actually did become a doctor. Um, my second sister, my oldest sister, became a lawyer, and then I just knew since I was four years old that I wanted to be a writer. So I had to kind of get around my parents for a long time. I guess that's how I became a writer. Okay. I mean, yeah. yeah. I went to and the it, Kennedy School. Yeah. Um, and when I was there, I realized that the approach to problems at the Kennedy School, while valid, wasn't really working for me. I was mm -hmm. more interested in just exploring the problems as a human and, and learning more about them than trying to solve them. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, definitely the spreadsheets were a factor. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I remember they, they would have a, we would take a class and there would be a case study and it would be the Detroit debt crisis of the 1970s and they would give us the information about it and then say, um, okay, now write a one-page memo solving the problem. <laughs> okay. No, but I mean, it's, it's a way of yeah, working yeah. It, and it, you know, yeah. it's just not my way. Yeah, and you uh, you just uh, you just mentioned that you were you were thinking about uh, the human the human condition you um, other other problems um, when uh, you read your two chapters you touched on so many aspects of a human life the achievement versus the self hatred why do I stay in this marriage um, what has my dad done to me all um, all of the <laughs> denial of the parents. Um, in how far um, do you consider your book, um, because you were talking in the beginning about assimilation, um, are, are these concerns of assimilation or humanity in general? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't know if I can speak on behalf yeah. of humanity in general. <laughs> oh, you can. I, you can. I, I feel like, you know, I think the thing, the thing that's interesting to me, by the time I finished the book, both of the, the, um, both of the parents have, have died in the book. I think I can say that without spoiling anything, honestly. Um, and so the children are left in this country that they were not the ones who originally came there. Mm -hmm. They live there. And they've also been through a whole lot in the book. I mean, you can get a taste of it in this chapter. But I mean, there's a lot uh, that happens that they do and don't do. Everybody has their passions that they spend in ways that are like not necessarily ideal. And by the end of the book, they feel that, you know, they ask themselves, like, are we, are we still here um, mm. in terms of, you know, are, are, I mean, are we still immigrants? Don't we now, aren't we now basically really, aren't our lives basically lives of this place where we spent our passions, you know, where we mm. did bad things and where we have our ghosts? It's, yeah. And um, what about... Um You, you, you just, um, we, we heard a little bit about it. What about the women in the novel? How do they answer this question? Do they answer I mean, the answer women the in the novel, oh, that's so interesting. Okay, so Brenda, who Dago's in love with, okay, so the mother, I should start with mm -hmm. the mother. The mother, Winnie, um, she is sort of a character that I can relate to. She, um, she is what what you could call extravagant. And I've heard people say this about people in their families. Like she's the one who wants way more food than anyone can eat at every meal. You know, do you, everyone knows a character like this or somebody like this in their family. She, um, she's the one who is super generous to everybody, um, just stacks and piles up supplies. Um, she, she cares about everything so much. Um, she's very passionate. She's very in love with her husband, who's a terrible person. Um, and so at some point before the novel starts, she decides to turn her back on passion and become a Buddhist. And I know a lot of people like this. I mean, a lot of people I know become Buddhist because they just don't want to be with their feelings anymore. And I don't blame them at all. And I was advised to do the same. Um, I'm just not able to focus um, on meditation. But... Um, but uh, But um, so, so that's sort of her personality. Yeah, okay. Um, and then each of the brothers has a love interest, and each of these people has a really specific personality. Brenda, who's Dago's love interest, is um, she wants to be taken care of, and she says to one of the characters early in the novel that what she wants is to like, go to the gym and, mm -hmm. you know, just redo her house. That's what she wants. She wants... Mm -hmm not to be anymore working as a waitress, which is what she's mm -hmm. doing in the novel. Um, so that's her initial goal in the novel, um, which is a problem for Dago because he doesn't have any money. And this is one of the reasons that he wants to become a partner in the restaurant so that he can, quote unquote, take care of her the way she wants to be taken care of. And then the, and then the problem is, of course, that he's engaged. He's been engaged uh, to somebody else, I mean, for a super long time, like 10 years or I, mm -hmm. I don't know. A very long time. And this person is Catherine, and Catherine's one of my favorite characters. I think she's mentioned briefly in this chapter. Catherine uh, is adopted by well-meaning people in Sioux City, 
and grows up eating like all American food. You know, ant, has anyone ever had ants on a log? Yes. yes. Okay. So she she grew up eating all American food, and she's she in college discovered her um, or started to discover uh, the background where she was of the country where she was born, China, and she becomes completely interested in things Chinese and um, Chinese food. You know, she's the one who wants tea because it's more authentic. And then, uh, and then there's also uh, James, who's who's really in love with his childhood friend Alice, who's a member of the Chinese American community, and is sort of a secret artist. She, I think, blossoms a lot in the course of the novel. So, the, and there's another character named Lynn who keeps a blog, um, who shows up in the second half of the novel. Okay. So basically, those are the, a lot of the major yeah. women. There's Thank also you. actually there's some more women. Yeah. There's a the, there's a woman in the in the restaurant, uh, Olan, who is you know a character who does like a lot of the work for the restaurant, um, and she is kind of their um, their employee. Uh, she's the person they boss around. Um, she's a very recent immigrant. And then there's also a when Winnie becomes a Buddhist. There's a local Buddhist woman, the abbess of their community, um, sort of temple. It's not really a temple, as they point out, but she, um, she's sort of the wise woman of the book. Okay, thank so you so much. Yeah, sure. I, <laughs> there are a lot of characters. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, I want to give all of you a chance. Uh, my colleague will pass around a microphone, and there is the first question from Channing. Channing. <laughs> Hello. Um, I just wonder, as, as I hear you speak, I, I'm wondering if the characters you're describing, if you identify them as parts of yourself, and, um, and uh, if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. I think, and I don't want to speak on behalf of all writers, but okay, so one time I took a personality test with somebody who actually, it was like their job to evaluate people's personalities. Um, and, and he said that there are people who have, like, everybody has different parts to them. And that a lot of people have, like, maybe three parts. This is, you know, the whatever, this part, that part, and the in-between part. But he said I had, like, 23 parts. <laughs> so I think, that, I think that there are a lot of different, different parts of me in various characters. And it's one of the reasons that I enjoyed writing this book. I mean, these people do a lot of things that I've never done and wouldn't do. Um, but, it, but, yeah, I'm sure that they have, each of them, a kernel of me. Good or bad? I don't know if that's helpful. Thank you. Amy, Amy and then Juana, and then Bertrol. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, Johanna. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That was, I was wrapped in attention. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Um, I was really interested in the structure of the storytelling of like the first son and the second son. And it feels like that storyteller is tapping into archetypes. And it made me want to ask how much you think of your characters as archetypes and how much you think of them as like specific individuals or are you kind of switching between thinking of them as in, in both those ways as you're writing? You know. I have been told that some of my characters are archetypal, but it's not something I think about consciously. Yeah. But but what, yeah. So what do you think people mean by that, then? I mean... You know, it's... Just trying to reach... I assume what they mean is reaching toward thing, an understanding that we all have in common about... Mm -hmm. People, some people. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, for me it felt like they were representing this like role. This is the role that this character is playing. Like the first son, the second son. This is what they do. This is what they do. Yeah. Definitely Ming does that on purpose. Ming yeah. puts them into that category. He doesn't talk about James because he's mostly just concerned about him and his older brother. He's mm -hmm. obsessed. Mm -hmm. He's obsessed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. He's obsessed that he wasn't born first, if you didn't notice. <laughs> Hi, Sam. What a fabulous reading. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, um, I think there's a way in which um, 
uh, writers of color, right, are very often sort of thinking, thinking of race in relation to forms of whiteness. And particularly in Wisconsin, right, um, there are sort of these Asian characters and then this kind of white world. And I'm curious about moments where um, Asian, count, like, where you're not the only one, where you either encounter another Asian American, right? Like th that moment where it's like, oh no, I don't, you know, I don't date Asian women. Or like where they encounter others who are likewise immigrants outside and maybe trying to see or not see one another. Uh, so I'm just curious if there are those moments um, or how you think about those moments that are not about the exceptional in relation to whiteness, but in relation to something else. I mean, I think in this novel, the characters who are dealing with that the most um, are Ming. Ming is dealing with it the worst, and Catherine is also. But Catherine is sort of, because she was adopted, she had been thinking about race for, you know, in a conscious way um, for longer than Ming, if that makes sense, because she's, she's just conscious of it since she's a younger character, uh, since she's smaller. Um, and she decides to learn as much as she can about the culture and uh, of the country where her parents, where she, she was born. And she deliberately seeks out relationships with other Asian characters um, to the point where this drives Ming particularly crazy because he doesn't want to think about it. He doesn't want to. And his huge issue in, in the book, I think, is that basically, I mean, I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but I think that they're like made for each other as, as partners, and he can't deal with that for the entire book, basically. <laughs> Those are the characters. I mean, everybody in the book is dealing with that to some extent. Um, there's one character here, uh, Fang, um, friends of, friend of James, who just can't get any women interested in him at all because he's seen a certain way. Um, by the women he, that, who surround him. Um, he does sort of self-actualize in the book, however. Uh, th good things happen to him. But, um, but, you know, every character, in my mind, in my imagination, they all, all have a different... Um, constel in the constellation, they all have different degrees of sort of um, acceptance of the situation, dealing with it, um, working it out, not, or ignoring it. I'm always interested in place and novels, and I noticed Haven is the latter word for, or the second word in New Haven, where you went to college. college. Um, it's also said in Wisconsin, where you grew up. And I'm curious in terms of what Haven represents and what it represents about the immigrant experience. You know, it's just always, you know, interesting and curious. Um, how immigrant families end up in a particular place. And then, you know, ultimately, you know, what keeps them there, right? Sure. Given the challenges that exist in that place and what you, in contrasting it with what you can imagine, might be better alternatives in other places. I don't know. The immigrant experience is hard everywhere, but um, maybe there might be opportunities or maybe there might be that desire to seek out those other opportunities in other places. So I was wondering in terms of how did Haven come to being in this book and what does it represent, if anything, to you about the immigrant experience in America? I mean, for me, obviously the name Haven is somewhat ironic. It is a haven for them, um, for the family, and they do flourish there. The father does open a successful business. Um, in the book, the backstory is that he and the mother met in Chicago and decided to move to Haven because they didn't have a Chinese restaurant there. You know, they wanted, they wanted to start a business. Um, and they succeed to a large extent in doing this. On the other hand, as you can see, life isn't what it appears. It's not perfect. Um, and part of the, part of the uh, dynamic in the book is, is about being invisible and visible. So in the first part of the book, it's um, they see themselves. It's about the community within itself. In the second part of the book, um, things happen that cause the community to become the object of observation and scrutiny from the surrounding community and a larger community, presumably. And they become 
uh, visible in a way that they never have been in an uncomfortable way. Um, I guess I would say that um, I think toward the end of the book, though, they're all there in Haven. They've become used to it as this place uh, where they recognize in some ways as home. Which is, the, in a way, the opposite of what happened to my family. Um, I have three sisters, and all of us essentially left Wisconsin. We have Thomas and Alec, or Alec and Thomas. <laughs> um, I'm also very interested in place in fiction, and I was curious if this is a very Midwestern setting, right, the, the, this town in Wisconsin, and I very much am very fond of other Midwestern writers, novelists, and I wonder if you see this, do you see your, the book and, your, and other writing as being sort of in conversation with other Midwestern writers, you know, I think of obviously Franzen, who's everywhere here now in Germany again with his new novel, and he's very much a kind of upper Midwestern writer, but also Jane Smiley, and I think I thought of her when I was listening to this because her, of course, her, what was that, Thousand Acres was based on King Lear, King Lear. similar to, you know, yeah. to this in Karamazov, and, or Charles Baxter, just all these wonderful, you know, the writers of sort of the upper Midwestern kind of small city, small town experience. And do you, do you think there is kind of a school there or that you're part of and that you sort of are somewhat in, you know, some kind of conversation with or is that, or not so much? Is that overthinking it? No, I love all the writers that you mentioned. Um, Charles Baxter inspired the scene that, in some ways, the scene that you read, I mean, that I read, um, in a lecture I heard of his uh, called Making a Scene, in which he felt like people didn't write like Dostoevsky because they were trying to behave themselves too much. Everybody was trying to be polite and, well, you know, well-behaved and not to make a scene and not to embarrass themselves. And he said he wanted a scene in which someone shouted for a cup of coffee. Um, you know, and I thought, okay, I'm going to write a scene like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so another person who I really admire... Um, that I think has inspired some, in some ways, the geography of the book is William Maxwell. Mm -hmm. uh, in his work, mm -hmm. um, so many of his books are set in Illinois, yeah. um, rural sort of, small town Illinois, in the sort of early 20th century, 1920s, when they were building all the houses mm -hmm. that are now um, in my imaginary world, lying in the streets of Haven. And especially the back sides of the houses that have these alleys where people, I think, would drive horses up. Um, the back alleys of Haven become very important in the novel. And I read about, I mostly think about William Maxwell when I think about the um, sort of space in the novel. Um, I'm a big fan of Jane Smiley's. Uh, I think I'm a big fan of all the writers you mentioned. I'm... Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. But I don't know if there's a school. Yeah. I'm not, right. I'm not okay. the one to ask. I mean, there is obviously our school. Right, right. <laughs> yes. But I don't but our people come to our school from all over the right. place. Right. I like right next to you to Thomas, okay. please. Thank you. Um, can you remind me of can you remind me of the names of the three sons? They're James, Ming, and Dago is the Dago. oldest. Hi, Thomas. So Hi. Dago <laughs> is the first. He's big dog. That's mm -hmm. what it means in Chinese. Because there's this, um, there's this thing that runs through the book about dogs. Uh, he's big dog. Ming is the um, second dog. And James is the small dog or third dog. And his nickname is Snaggle because uh, Sango is third dog. And if you s sort of trans pose the N and the A, it's Snaggle. Hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, I was, I, your reading sort of made me think about this. I, I, it sort of, I don't know, like it seemed like you were, might have been trying to yeah, put forth this tension between success and failure. And I was thinking if maybe you could say a little bit more about how yeah, 
this idea of success and failure turn also on this idea of self negation in different ways. Like one of the sure. one of the characters, you know, was kind of self negating through conventional success, and the other one through just a failure to live up to some sort of imposed potential. Um, maybe I'm like reading no. too much into it, but. Uh, <coughs> No, I think you described it really well. I think that Ming is self-negating through his pursuit of what he thinks of as American success. Um, and it's his primary conflict in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And Dago, yeah, he sees himself as a nobody because he hasn't become the person his parents want him to be. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, do you, do you, are you reading any, any sort of redemption into the idea of failure? I mean, I think that by the end of the book, I can't tell you what happens, but okay. Dago fails in a spectacular way. And I think that everyone in the book loves and accepts him in some way. And so there's a kind of peaceful understanding of that. Mm -hmm. It's hard to explain it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I need for the guest, Christine. Um, thank you for a wonderful reading. And uh, I already pre-ordered the book. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have to wait Which till February do, to get it. Which you also do, by the it. way. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's out on February 1, small advertisement here next year. Um, you tell the story in this reading entirely through conversation. And I was quite struck by, I mean, it's almost an architectural feature that the story emerges through the words of different personalities, but there's very little third-person writing here, and I'm just curious uh, why you choose this structure, this or did you choose it? No, is no, it no comes I did. Naturally, what is the what's why do you choose this? I got sick of um, the rules, quote unquote, of dialogue as described by my teachers maybe 20 years ago. One of my teachers, who shall remain nameless and who I really adore and who's now passed on, said that for every line of dialogue you use, you should have 10 lines of narrative. That dialogue should be used sparingly, I'm not gonna say if at all, because obviously you need a little bit, but um, they just didn't believe in it. They also didn't believe in exclamation points. Like <laughs> my old, my, okay, I can say, so, okay, I, I, won't, I won't call them out here. Somebody said, okay, I won't, I won't do it. But no exclamation points, basically. Um, I just got sick of it. I, you know, I just got really tired of it. <laughs> it's I, extremely effective, I would say. It the works in some Emerging of a situations. story through conversation. I mean, sometimes it works in the story. There are large passages that are all narrative also. I guess I just wanted to enjoy myself when I was writing this. And um, when I started writing, which was back in the early 90s and late, yeah, early 90s, um, everyone was following like a certain way of writing that is perfectly honorable and good. I just, I did learn to write that way and then I just started to get tired of it. In fact, I just wrote, one of the reasons my project, my current project at the Berlin Academy is kind of right now sitting like on my desk and I'm looking askance at it, is it's 200 pages, but it, but it's back to the old way. And I realize that even though it's got a lot of valuable stuff in it that I want to keep working on, I just don't want to write like that right now. I want to have fun. Like my life is, you know, I'm old and I have like, a, I have a tire, you know, tiring day job. And like, I just want to have fun when I'm working on books. And so for me, that's like exclamation points, people yelling. You know. <laughs> I have one here with a virtual question mark from Karl and Mary Ann van der Heijn. Um, <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> Hello. <laughs> Do you think the immigrant experience in the Midwest is different from that one on the coast? I'm sure it is because in the Midwest, I mean, unless you're talking Chicago, in the, in the Midwest experience I'm talking about, which is in a small city, um, pretty much surrounded by crops, um, there just aren't as many people 
in a community um, from the community from the country that people came from. You know, like here in Berlin, there seem to be a lot of people from a lot of different countries, and there are many communities. Um, if you grew up in the town where I did, for example, my earliest in my earliest memories, we were one of two Chinese families in a town of fifty thousand. Eventually, became one of three. Um, I mean, I just remember having very little in the way of community for quite a while until it became um, just more populated. All right. Okay. Thank you. More questions? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So thanks for Asian American and Western representation. <laughs> really appreciate it. And a wonderful reading. Um, we've been talking a lot about birth order amongst siblings, which is obviously very important in Chinese culture and Asian culture. Um, how did it work in structuring the family also in terms of the relationship to the parents or the favorite? Because did you choose to kind of go in a more tension building route against tradition? Or like, how did that also play into the relationships of the siblings to themselves in their roles and to the parents? Okay, um, I tried to describe it a little bit in this chapter in which I think, so I think, but in other chapters it's clear that James is, he's a very sweet kid and he's the youngest. And so everybody's kind of like, oh, James, you know, you love me. That's sort of, that's sort of what it's like for James. And he does, he does love everybody. So he's in good shape, basically, in the family birth order. They take care of him. Everyone always pays for the youngest. And he doesn't have that sort of, sort of urge and desire and like fury that some youngest children actually do feel that they want to be recognized, they want to be important, they want to be taken seriously, they want to be given a voice. He does not feel that way. I mean, I was that way too. I, I was the third out of four and I was perfectly happy just sort of watching everything going on and like reading a book. Um, but Dago is the oldest. He feels, he, I think, I think the thing about him is he doesn't, He's, he's, he's aware of his role as the oldest, but he also on some level doesn't realize that, um, that he doesn't realize the advantages that being the oldest have. I don't know, I think, I find him sympathetic. I think, I mean, he's, he, he goes on and on in various other chapters. He also rants and raves. Um, but, but he, uh, I think he's a, he tries to be responsible. He's just somewhat incompetent. He just can't quite do what he wants to do, but he feels responsible. And then Ming is just, he's the middle child and um, he's just like never happy. So I suppose that would be somewhat traditional that the, the middle child is unhappy, but I mean, I'm a middle child. Uh, I don't know, I think Ming's, Ming's got the biggest problems in a way out of the three kids in, in the book. Um, and I don't know if it's because he's the middle child or just because he's who he is, born in the circumstances he's born into. I don't know if that's a helpful answer. I mean, I can talk about <laughs> siblings and birth order for a super long time, but I'm not, you know, sure that everybody wants to hear me go on about it. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Juana. No. Um, I often feel a, a lot of times I'm thinking about the parents. Uh, the parents left China and left their parents or their family or their siblings. Um, I'm wondering what, if that's because they weren't the first child or they were the third child and it's like, okay, you got to go. Like how the relationship to China for the parents um, sort of hovers or haunts the relationship to the, the children. Because in a way, they broke, they did something that they perhaps was never expected or desired of them. They left, right? Yeah. Um, Leo is such an, he's such a complicated character and such a problem in a way that, he really escaped, like he needed to get out of China for various reasons and wanted to get out of China, which becomes a little bit more clear or explicated in, in the book, not a ton. I mean, one of the problems with writing about families that I discovered is that at some point I just have to start the story. Like I can't 
put in like one time, I think I spent an entire year on a fellowship at Princeton writing 150 pages about the grandparents of my family. And then at the end of the year, my friend read it and she said, you know, it doesn't get going until after page 150. And I had to just cut it all out. But yeah, I mean, it is interesting. That I'll, I think, okay, so here's something that I think is interesting historically about these particular immigrants. There was a period in Chinese history where Really, if you left China, this is after 1949 and before 19, gosh, before ping pong diplomacy, you really couldn't communicate with your family on the mainland in a very easy way at all, if at all. And so leaving was really leaving. At one point, Leo tries to send a package back, and that's basically one bit of the story, but I couldn't put in a ton of it. I think are we, we ha are we good? Any more questions? If not, uh, I have to admit that Christine kind of stole my last question, <laughs> which was when is the book coming out? Um, oh, <laughs> but, yeah. Um, February 1, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, thank you so much for a fascinating reading. Um, we can't wait until the book is coming out. Oh, great! Um, and we're all pre-ordering it. Um, for you, um, yeah, I, um, I think most of you know that normally we um, would have a reception here. Um, we can't do this, so uh, this time for you, leaving is also really leaving. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you so much and have a great evening. Thank you so much.